Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Um, right back at you. <laughs> right? It is April mm, 16th. 16th today. <laughs> Anyone else is confused? Sure, but... I'm not even exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For real. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the day. I don't know the date. Um, um, so happy um cheer seminar. I'm happy to introduce today Dr. Zubin Modi, who is a pediatric nephrologist and clinical health services researcher. He directs the pediatric nephrology research program, and as we know, is one of our star investigators at the Cheer Center. Um, overall, his research agenda focuses on ensuring that proven medical care and ongoing discovery are optimally delivered to patients with kidney disease. He's also the PI of the Kidney Research Network, Data Analysis and Coordinating Center, a multi-center electronic health record registry for pediatric and adult kidney disease. Thank you for joining us, and we're excited to hear about it. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, care and kidney research network a little bit, and uh, also a little bit of um, <laughs> where I've been the last year. Um, so, if you don't know me, which you, uh, <laughs> which you may not, because um, I'm never here, um, uh, I'm Zubin. Um, and for the past year, I've been um, transitioning into this directorship role of the Peace Nephrology Research Program, which has um, been one that uh, was unexpected and also um, included a lot of things and uh, and responsibilities that I had not had any experience with before. Um, and one of the big things that I included was taking on clinical research that I hadn't been kind of a part of or doing for a really long time. Um, and so um, as I kind of embarked on that role, I was kind of really focused on my HSR agenda, kind of writing grants, all of those things, um, very specifically about um, claims research and, and EHR research, um, and found myself um, taking on um, quite a few different other things. And so the background of that is that my mentor, Deb Gibson, moved uh, to the NIH. And so because of that, she didn't take anything with her, like most PIs do when they go from institution to institution. Um, and so uh, because there's not that many nephrologists in the world or here at Michigan that do research, um, anything that needs a Pete's nephrologist, you have to find one. Um, and, um, you know, that ended up being me for a lot of things. Um, and so uh, among, uh, you know, we'll talk about KRN in a minute, but the other kind of bigger things that, that I've started to kind of work a lot more on are some prospective cohort studies that include biospecimen collection and things like that, things that I wasn't really thinking about um, holistically. Um, and so the last year, um, at least a good portion of it is, is while learning all of those things um, and relearning some of them, um, being that kind of clinical expert in a lot of ways, but then um, now trying to bring what I want to do from a research standpoint into those spaces more, mm -hmm. uh, which surprisingly has been uh, more necessary and accepted than I had expected it to be initially. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that, too, um, at the end if uh, folks are interested. So, like I said, um, I've really been working on applying HSR uh, to the clinical and translational research space. Um, and um, a lot of those things really include the HR data use um, and now uh, more mobile health um, use of data as well. Um, and it's, I've been learning a lot about how important kind of methodologic crosstalk can be because um, in talking with folks who do a lot more uh, kind of clinical, um, say, there's something, You're good. Go ahead. Um, sample kind of collection, uh, um, clinical research in those ways, um, along with clinical trials, is that a lot of the techniques, a lot of the data sources that we use on a regular basis are of, of great interest, but don't have a lot of you know expertise within that those groups. And so um, it's been a, it's been a nice experience to kind of be able to provide some of that insight, um, and more importantly, what the limitations are, uh, because that's not something that's always kind of first um, uh, something that's thought about kind of at first blush. Uh, so one, I guess one example of this is um, at the most recent uh, American Society Nephrology Conference, I gave a talk on how 
um, to kind of build a conceptual model of clinical trials for pediatrics. And a lot of that involved how do you build a trial that limits your resource utilization as much as possible because we know that um, most kind of industry sponsors are not going to be able to have a very long drawn out trial. So how do you use all the existing data out there already to inform the trial that you're going to build so you can do the smallest trial possible um, in the shortest amount of time possible. And so a lot of that includes, you know, um, our causal inference methodologies and things along those lines that really can kind of help uh, inform that. So we're going to talk a little bit about KRN, um, the structure, um, some of the dashboards and things like that that we use. Um, introduce uh, our next kind of phase of, well, we have two, two um, new phases of KRN, but uh, mobile health registry, which is um, part of our ongoing KRN um, expansion, um, and then some of the ongoing research efforts um, involved as well. It's a relatively short talk, so if folks have questions or want to talk about kind of expand on things um, along the way, please feel free to, um, to jump in. I'm happy to elaborate on any points. So the Kidney Research Network, um, as Sarah mentioned in the introduction, um, is a multi-center uh, registry. Um, it um, is EHR-based um, and um, was initially uh, established as a way to bring in patients who have proteinuric kidney disease, uh, which usually means a glomerular type of kidney disease, and usually a primary um, kidney disease as opposed to something that's um, developed from diabetes or high blood pressure or something along those lines. Um, but along with the actual kind of data elements, uh, it was actually built out to be uh, a larger network that was encompassing a lot of different types of research. Um, and uh, it includes some quality initiatives, um, the kind of outcomes and, and data um, portions of it, and also a larger trials network that, um, uh, that can be utilized in various ways, along with um, some consulting that, um, that happens on occasion, depending on our staffing um, availability um, for um, building trials as well with the overall mission to improve kidney disease treatment and options for um, patients with um, uh, options and optimized patient health. Um, it was initially established with uh, funding from foundations. Um, and so that's kind of been um, uh, kind of the main source of funding um, thus far. So as how many members it might be like so seven um seven uh sites I'll actually it's out here uh so um it launched in 2015 uh across seven centers we're expanding to nine um uh currently uh the initial registry was actually of consented patients so you would actually have uh, patients at those sites you would can you would um, approach them in a kind of traditional fashion you would ask them kind of a one-time um you know uh you know, will you share your ehr data um, the, uh, and then following that, the uh, folks at each individual site would also do a little bit of chart abstraction about a couple of key parameters. And the specific one we were after for the KRN consented core, which um, my team has now lovingly referred to as uh, KRN Classic, um, is, um, uh, is um, the biopsy reports and what the biopsy findings were, which actually has had um, some longer term uh, benefits um, as we talk about, to different industry sponsors about their industry and, and data sources. Um, and so that cohort's about 1,200 patients. Uh, and actually, some of our sites continue to consent to that cohort, so that uh, continues to, uh, to increase as well. Um, in the past year, uh, we have expanded KRN uh, under a waiver of consent um, to basically any patient that has been seen in a nephrology ambulatory visit ever. Uh, along with this, we are getting age match controls. Um, and so um, that expansion is ongoing now. Um, and as you could probably imagine, the uh, logistical challenges of that are not uh, small. Uh, but so for the expanded, yeah. with no consent, mm -hmm. everyone just gets assigned a number. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, so you can get that too. Uh, so sorry. No, you're good. Um, so basically, uh, everybody at the individual sites would get, um, a KRN kind of number assigned to them. Um, only that KRN number and not any of their kind of, you know, personal identifiable information on that person, um, and would get transferred over to the University of Michigan securely. Um, and it's housed here. Um, and those numbers would stay consistent from, uh, you know, 
from delivery of, of data to the next delivery of data so that everything's obviously consistent. Um, it also allows us um, to be able to add that additional um, manual data if necessary. Um, and so for the care and classic patients, we have um, those biopsy reports that you can kind of do those things for. Um, we've been in discussions and approached uh, about um, other ways and other things that may require additional chart abstraction. And so in some ways, if we can um, identify those patients in the, um, in the expanded cohort, we could potentially go back and get consent to do um, some additional work in that way too. Since it's since the data process that you described sounds like it is, um, you know, there's not identifiers that like what's another site like Cincinnati or something that you can Stanford. see from so the, so you can see from Stanford. Um, is there any way in which you can deduplicate across sites, or is it possible that you could be double counting across sites? Um, it is, I think, in theory, possible. Um, we have gone through, we've gone through some initial quality um, uh, metrics to kind of um, uh, get rid of what we would consider to be kind of very obvious duplicates. Um, but the centers are, well, they're starting to be closer together. So that may end up becoming a, a more kind of current problem than it was previously, because um, the centers were geographically dispersed enough that, you know, they will the likelihood of that would be relatively low. Um, that being said, this is an adult and pediatric cohort. And so, you know, um, uh, it's definitely something that we have looked into a little bit, but there's definitely a possibility for, for some duplicates, my assumption. Other questions? I'm gonna back up one minute to, um, so right now the cases um, are around, um, or cases and controls are around 96,000. We're expecting data from one of the new sites that um, has finally um, got things moving uh, in the next couple of weeks. So that number is going to go up uh, over 100,000. Um, Kevin, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Kevin. Oh, good morning. So I had a quick question, Zubin. Um, maybe you said this and I missed it. I'm trying to wrap my head around some of the data flow. Can you just speak to, is, do you guys have an honest broker in between the data movement here? Like how does that, that assignment work? Uh, or are you uh, assigning it and just, uh, you know, uh, de-identifying yourself or is there sort of a, a middleman involved here? The de-identification happens on the site's end uh, before it gets to us. Um, and so, the each there's a programmer at each EH or at each um, participating site, and that okay, it's, it's a distributed uh, type of thing as opposed to centralized. Correct. Okay, yeah, we we don't we don't get kind of a data dump and then do the de-identification ourselves. Um, yeah. That's that's done with our partners at each of the sites. I think right. it's straightforward enough when it's structured data. When we've done it centrally is when sites were pulling you know free text or unstructured data, and then we applied uh, kind of a, a consistent algorithm. It's, of course, never perfect to de-identify notes, but that was the only time we didn't ask them to do it. They sent us all their notes, and then we would de-identify consistently. But structured is, is yeah. fairly... We're, 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 well, we're, we can talk about this later as well, okay. but we're, we're, we're in the... We're in the we've, we've talked about doing kind of some natural language processing types of things for, for some of the things, uh, but the, all of that would still be distributed in this kind okay. of, in this kind of model currently. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's ideal. I that's mean, next step. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Um, I mean, you have a, a question in the chat also, to what extent are you incorporating community or is this EMR medical center only? Um, so the kind of, one of the, um, really, uh, nice things about KRN is it actually incorporates both, um, to the extent that's possible, um, community nephrology practices, as well as kind of academic centers. Um, and so, um, obviously, well, maybe not obviously to, to everybody here, but um, these nephrologists are at academic centers almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're not going to find a lot of pediatric nephrology practices that don't um, are at academic centers. But that's not the case for adult nephrology. And adult nephrology is a lot more distributed. So we do have um, a few practices or a few groups um, that are more community based um, in their um, in their scope. And so we do get data from those um, groups as well, which provides um, like a little bit of balance when it comes to the types of patients that you're seeing in the case mix that you're seeing. So this includes adults? Yes. Oh, yes. Traitor. I know. I was actually gonna mention that at the beginning. I've also become an adult researcher as well. <laughs> 
feels weird. Um, but anyways, so um, we go through kind of quality of assurance and, and, and things along those lines, and then we have kind of our initial database. We, we develop a, a, a standard analysis file from that, um, and that sits here at the University of Michigan uh, within our group um, in our database here. Um, I think, you know, thinking about some of the logistic hurdles that we've faced more recently, the data transfer, uh, the size of the data transfers themselves have become, I think, more problematic as we've expanded the data because we get all of the lab data on all of these patients. Um, and so, um, and since I'm not, we're not restricting it to any kind of specific set of lab data, that becomes a little bit problematic. So we've been having um, some challenges and uh, workarounds for, for some of those types of things. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, any other questions on kind of data? So these are um, some of the data elements. Um, sorry for the fuzziness of this. Uh, slide. Um, but I mean, um, to Aaron's point, uh, structured data um, throughout, um, we have um, a lot of different uh, labs and medications. I think one of the things that um, was always challenging for me at the start of uh, my faculty and my, my research career was that um, a lot of the data, a lot of the things when it comes to kidney disease are lab-based, and a lot of the things that I was initially using didn't have labs. Um, and so I could never be kind of completely confident in a lot of these things. So, so as we are able to kind of pull in that lab data and make it, you know, usable, um, that has been really kind of essential for, for me to kind of think about different ways that we can, um, we can use the data. Gary, you have a question? I was just trying to understand what the PK primary key, what that means for each of those things. Um, I think designation at each of those for some of the data elements. That's how you link the tables. Yeah, that's how you link the tables. So you can link them in different ways. Yeah. Um, are you all working off a common data model for this? So we kind of made our own common data model okay. um, uh, for this kind of when it initially started. Um, I have for this and for a few other projects that we've been talking about, EHR data extraction in various ways, um, I have kind of been investigating alternative common data models to potentially use. Um, and so that's something that may happen in the future because that would potentially allow some additional flexibility. Um, but for now, um, you know, the data comes to us from either a clarity poll or whatever uh, the institution has. Um, you know, and once we get it, we'll kind of transform it into the into our common data model. Jeremy? Um, I guess related to that, I was wondering, as you do have some lab data, is this entered? I was wondering about units. Like yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you direct Units that? are tough. Um, so we do have all of the units for the most part. Some of the transitions from units that are you know, not everybody reports units in the same way. So there's some standardization of that to what we would classify, you know, and we, we think about this mostly for, you know, things like creatinine, urine protein, Even things for like the that. For non-clinicians, can yeah. you just tell people what this way yeah. about? Yeah, so, um, so when you, you know, when you have lab values, it's, it's important that you're comparing apples to apples and not every institution reports the lab values with the same unit. So for instance, when you're thinking about a serum sodium value in your blood, um, the typical here that you it's um, it's reported in um, uh, in uh, milligrams per deciliter, um, and but it could be reported in grams per liter. Um, it can be reported in a lot of different ways. Um, in urine, it actually gets even more varied in how you how people report it. And, um, and in urine also you have issues with, was it a spot collection and was it a ratio versus was it a 24 hour sample where they're only giving you in a milligrams. Um, so all of those things need to be standardized and also you'd be able to compare kind of one thing to another. Um, and so, you know, from a urine standpoint, we do that to the best of our abilities. And when we can't do that, are there different enough, val or different enough you know, ways that it's uh, presented? And then we kind of have a if or kind of uh, logic, skip logic kind of thing to that as well. Um, on the bottom, you'll see kind of the manually captured report that's specifically for the uh, consented cohort for the time being. Um, so kind of the biopsy, the you know, the diagnosis that came from that biopsy. Um, that's really important for that initial cohort because um, ICD codes have not been very good at capturing pathologic 
um, issues on slides. Um, so FSGS is probably one of the ones that you'll see with type, type of kidney disease. It's a, it's a pattern on, on a biopsy slide once you get a kidney biopsy, um, but it doesn't always um, uh, reflect. It could be that they were evaluated for it or it was suspected, something along those lines. When it comes to things like, um, you know, that don't necessarily always require a biopsy for confirmation, then you have to run into whether it actually was that disease or whether you're presuming it was that disease and that heart becomes difficult in structured data. The other thing that I think is incredibly difficult and we're still working really hard to figure out kind of without some manual data capture is steroid response patterns. Jeremy, I would love your input or your thoughts on this from um, an IBD perspective, but um, at least for nephrotic syndrome, which is a type of kidney disease that sometimes you treat with steroids, um, patients will sometimes have a script at home just in case. Um, and I don't know when they've started and when they've stopped it. And it becomes really difficult to understand their patterns of their lab values to their, how much they've taken the medications. And, you know, um, since it's an EHR database, I don't have the claims to know when they actually filled the prescriptions. Um, and so that becomes a little bit tough to figure out kind of those steroid response patterns if you're not looking at notes or have a, other, another way to kind of figure that out. Sure scripts data can be helpful, but it's only when it's to know sure scripts data. Yeah, pharmacy fill. Yeah. But you have to manually, I think, call a year's worth into the record. I mean, that's a question. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, so can you just uh, say a little bit more about how you structure those data? That That's a really interesting table. So you have this steroid response. Is this all like narrative type data? What, like, you know, how, how do you classify it? Is there some yeah, sort of so, um, classification? So steroid response data or response pattern usually ends up getting classified into a couple of different buckets. One is that if they ever responded to steroids or not. Um, one is um, that they responded to steroids, but they're dependent on those steroids now, um, or they're kind of um, responsive to steroids completely. Um, so those are kind of usually the three different buckets. Um, there may be some additional data that we collect about kind of um, if they were previously really responsive and now have become not responsive, because that's a pattern that's important for us to know, because that kind of dictates what type of kidney disease and outcomes that they might have. Um, but, uh, but yeah, usually it's, it's kind of labeling them as to what type of steroid response they have, as opposed to kind of a longitudinal response to the steroids over time. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Oops. Um, I'll, I'll just add on one quick question. So are you, it, it sounds like then it's structured data. You talked about putting it in buckets. Yes. So that sounds yeah, like, okay. This is all structured data, correct? Right, so you're not using like natural language processing to like find not a, not at this point. Uh, okay, I'll mention um, towards the end uh, a, a grant that we've recently submitted that that well will hopefully help with that too. All right, thank you. Okay, so this network, um, one of the kind of things, the big uh, the kind of important parts is that there's a lot of back and forth between. Um, the data coordinating center and the sites, and there's kind of value added on different levels. And so one of the things we've done is develop um, dashboards for the populations, and they are also site-specific dashboards. So this is the population of care and classic as a whole, um, uh, but um, it also would include, um, you know, breakdowns of your individual institutions um, group. Uh, and that kind of gets a little bit both to uh, a quality uh, component where we can um, start to um, provide information about how we're doing with um, various um, met metrics over time. So we had a, a blood pressure quality um, improvement um, uh, you know, project um, previously. We're going to be instituting another one actually now in the expanded cohort, uh, which hopefully will, will give us a lot more information across the population, a lot more uh, uh, kind of robust uh, ability to um, improve our care of, uh, of blood pressure in patients um, across the, the, the network. Um, but you can kind of toggle between all different kind of uh, um, groupings um, and things along those lines um, to kind of get the, the population that you're at least interested in, in knowing how, how they're doing or who they are. So Ian, yeah. um, to support the quality improvement initiatives, how often are these data updated? 
So right now, all data um, come into Michigan monthly. Okay. Um, and so uh, that's actually a, a point of, of discussion about kind of how often we're going to be doing um, these updates and for what reasons. Um, but currently, um, um, every, the seventh of every month is data day. Um, and so um, they'll, they'll come in on that day usually. And do you know, is it fairly, you know, labor intensive on the sites part or have they automated it? So, they so once, it? once everything is, so we're, we're going through a lot of kind of iteration with the expanded cohort, but for, I would say for the, for those who are still doing just the classic or, or for us now at Michigan who have done the full expanded cohort, um, it's, you know, it's a kind of routine thing per, per month. Um, different sites have different kind of abilities to do, to automate that. So here, you know, with your office's help, uh, that becomes relatively um, straightforward. At other institutions, they actually have to run it every month. And so somebody actually has to physically run it. And so that part, we're still working out how kind of labor intensive that is. Um, and obviously how the reimbursement works for that, on a, on a, you know, on every site's basis. Because the idea would be is that once you have the code ready to go, unless you're making changes on what you're what you're grabbing or you know things like that that you wouldn't necessarily have to change the sql code that often just a quick question about the demographic information yeah. that's here so if i'm reading this correctly it looks like there's 111 roughly 10 percent missing from the hispanic or non his ethnicity designation is mm -hmm. that fair mm -hmm. but then if i look at race it shows only three missing and it seems like usually, because we've been looking at this stuff like yeah. big time, mm -hmm. and that's like a huge difference, difference yeah. that makes me wonder what something's going on here. Yeah, I, I have to go. This is also um, a, a, an old slide, so I don't, yeah. I don't know if we have, Just um, have to think to, about yeah. that's all. Um, but um, I don't expect you to explain. But it. Um, that's a good point. I think this is, you know. This gets back to some of the work that Jeremy we had done with the um, with the transplant population as well as kind of how reliable the race and ethnicity data are in general. Um, and I think as we kind of pull all these sites, we're having you know trying to figure that out too. Yes, and I'd be happy to chat with you about that because we've just we found variation yeah. or accuracy anywhere from forty one percent, yeah, to seventy eight percent across institutions. Who has access to the data dashboards? And as a related question, do you have concerns of the identifiability of this? You know, like, I'm pretty sure that somebody could be like, oh, that's me on some of these lower numbers. Uh, so uh, the, the dashboard is only available to um, the, the site-specific uh, folks. So um, you couldn't look at a different site's um, you can't, is that what you said? Yeah, you can, can you look at the whole you one? At, you can look at the, 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 the aggregate data you can look at, um, but as far as site-specific data from a different site that's not yours, you cannot look at that. But even in the aggregate one, you know, are you worried about those small cells being identifiable? Um, I mean, potentially. Um, I think that we have a lot of small cells. I think, I think these ones are also, um, you know, ones that are this kind of view is one that um, uh, is a little bit mocked up for, for folks to see. So I have to actually go back and see what the, the real numbers are. Um, but um, but yeah, it's something that, you know, we do have a, um, you know, when we're preparing for publication, we have, you know, a lower limit for what we'll, what we'll show and things along those lines as well. Um, this is uh, a, another kind of uh, kidney health dashboard um, type of uh, view. So instead of just the demographics, you can see, you know, this is for pediatric patients specifically, but, you know, um, what their EGFR, uh, you know, count is um, when they've had a urine protein creatinine ratio, their types of diagnoses that are, um, that are available, and then also what type of, what stage of chronic kidney disease that they have. Um, so different ways to kind of look at that, uh, that dashboard. Um, and then you could potentially do it for patients individually as well. Um, but, uh, you know, and that, that's one of those things when it comes to eligibility, which we're going to talk about next. So one of the other things, um, and this gets a little bit more into kind of that clinical data and, and clinical um, studies, is that because we have the data for all of these patients, um, we can actually develop eligibility tables for different studies. 
um, and for different trials as well. And so what happens is that all of the data kind of on a either monthly basis or however often it happens, uh, we can um, we can apply filters based off of the trial eligibility or the research kind of study eligibility and find potentially eligible patients that can be approached, uh, which is really, I think, valuable for a lot of uh, both research st cohort studies, but also trials where their um, and their rates of approach and sc their screen ne their screen um, uh, negative rates are, are quite high uh, for some specific studies, especially when it comes to rare diseases, which most of the pediatric kidney disease, especially, but also adult kidney disease, can be. You know, there's a lot of rare diseases that are under investigation, um, and so uh, you can kind of uh, and obviously all of the, the the study names have been removed from this, but um, you can kind of get a sense of who's eligible, who might not be eligible, and why um, to be able to kind of. Uh, Owned down on a patient population that's uh, a benefit. Is this a manual component or is this automated? So this, so we you know it's, it's automated. So you'll okay. apply the filters on onto Great. the onto the um, uh, onto the population. Um, there is usually some additional kind of manual like review to make sure, um, and then depending on what the arrangement is, we provide that data to you know the the study group mm -hmm. as far as those patients and and potentially how to approach them as well. Um, we haven't yet done this in the expanded cohort because obviously there's the consent issues that we need to kind of think a little bit more about. Um, but for the for the consented cohort, they're all consented to be approached for additional studies, um, and so um, we're able to kind of facilitate that for research for protection. From a kind of uh, sort of study planning perspective, it also is, can be potentially helpful for folks who are interested in putting a study together um, to get a sense of at what sites would be kind of uh, better for them to, to utilize now. Questions? Do you guys have like in place any DUAs or a common IRB or something that if I saw oh, these two sites have like this rare disease that we have here too, you could kind of get- Yeah, we have, we, have a, we have a kind of an overarching CDA. Um, oh, good, yeah. Uh, for the group and, and, and because it's, it's not its own, <laughs> organizations run through the university, sure. um, you know, uh, all the CDAs kind of run through me for it. And so I'm able to kind of facilitate most of those things as well. How um, big is your team? Here? Yeah. Uh, 11, 12. Kevin has his hand up. Hey, Kevin. Uh, so um, question about uh, how the the mechanics of this, uh, we don't have to get into all the uh, weeds, but I'm just trying to figure out like, okay, so how, how do you, then go back to get consent from these people? Because if I understand this, I mean, it, it, it seems really cool. So you've got this centralized sort of dashboard here of who's eligible for what, but they're de-identified at this point, right? Don't you so, have to go? Yeah, so, so, um, so these are de-identified um, and this we've mostly done these types of recruitments on the patients who are already consented um, so uh, we have the ability to go back and reach them. So what would end up happening is the care and IDs would get, um, uh, we would kind of identify patients at whatever sites, and then the care and IDs would get kind of uh, linked back to particular patients at the site level. So we would return a list of care and IDs to the site, okay. and they would be able to, to identify the patients themselves. Thank you. Um, so speaking to some of these potential kind of limitations, uh, both in um, the ability for us to reach out to patients in various ways, um, but then also for kind of consenting issues along those lines. And um, one of the things we, um, in addition to this expanded uh, um, cohort, uh, we've launched is a kidney mobile health registry, um, which utilizes a, is, it's app based um, um, to be able to um, kind of hopefully broaden EHR data capture um, in, in a specific way. Um, have more opportunity for patient reported data collection and engagement. Um, and uh, very importantly, for a rare disease such as ours, expand that pool outside of the kind of seven, nine centers that we're able to utilize. And so uh, this is based out, I actually didn't even put the full name of the app on here. Um, it, My Data Helps is the application. Um, if for those of you who do not know it, it's a mobile health application um, uh, that's uh, supported the parent company Care Evolution, which is here in Ann Arbor. Uh, it 
it has a lot of functionality, um, including kind of wearable technologies, uh, remote consents, EHR data linkage, return of results, and dashboards. Um, it's used in some pretty large studies, including the All of Us study and the um, Framingham uh, e cohort um, um, when they made their kind of transition to, to, the, to the electronic kind of capacities. Um, application features that we're currently um, utilizing would be the EHR data linkage, um, notifications uh, and dashboard, sorry, survey deliveries and a participant dashboard to return some um, results in a kind of more uh, patient centric way, um, as opposed to your portal um, that doesn't necessarily tell you all that much about kind of what your kidney disease is doing. And so these are just some screenshots of what that um, would look like. Um, so you have kind of an opening page. Uh, you go through kind of the My Data Helps um, things, then you can um, enter into the Kidney uh, Mobile Health Registry. This can actually be done um, where um, a coordinator or somebody at your institution uh, asks um, or gives you information to participate. Um, we are also setting this up so that patients can seek us out and find us on their own and can send through the application as well. Um, and, and so that's kind of an ongoing process. Even if they're not affiliated with one of this participate. Correct. We'll have a screening tool built into the application so that they can screen themselves into the study or out of the study. Um, this is actually, uh, we're using this for a couple of different um, studies currently. And so there's a little bit of a kind of nuance to what study you potentially get into and things like that. Um, we have a full consent uh, that goes into the application as well. Um, and then um, you can be off and running. Uh, I'm not going to go too much more into kind of the details of the mobile health application. Um, I mentioned this a little bit, but we do have some trial design and trial conduct, um, uh, you know, uh, things that we do through KRN as well. Um, we can kind of analyze um, our data to get a sense of what a trial design would look like for um, a particular um, study. And then with our network, um, we're able to, you know, facilitate uh, potentially eligible patients at different states. Um, from a research standpoint, uh, we've had a lot of different uh, focus foci um, um, throughout the years, um, but a lot of them have been, you know, either outcome related or um, side effect related. Um, one of the big things that has come out of this work, along with I think building cohorts together with other collaborators, is um, that uh, oh, yeah, I moved the slides around. Uh, is that KRN is being actually asked to bring data into some specific initiatives that help um, with developing endpoints for um, trials, surrogate endpoints for trials. Um, rationale is kind of similar <laughs> to what we talked about earlier, is that um, they want to stop these trials earlier, but they don't have enough data to support doing that if they can't link the surrogate outcome to the longer term outcome. And because we have longer term data with the EHR data, um, that if you can find that, you know, a decrease in protein in your urine is indicative of you having um, preserved kidney function long term, then that would be helpful from an FDA um, perspective. And so, um, Aaron's already been um, in the work that was done by um, Dev uh, prior to me and uh, one of our former faculty, John Troost, um, and looking at kind of a, a, a surrogate protein marker, which wasn't like complete improvement, but also not, you know, um, uh, complete uh, badness as well uh, um, was um, was looked at. And then more recently, um, there's an initiative to do this in uh, focal cell mental glomerular sclerosis, specifically for partner area, because all of the trials have been, um, have failed recently because um, they haven't met kind of some specific criteria and we're at really kind of high risk of all of the drug companies pulling out of the work. Um, all together about the disease altogether. And so we're hoping in the next six months to a year to be able to um, produce some um, data that would be convincing enough to the FDA to um, to use, um, you know, a, some specific endpoints there. Um, and it's kind of to the point we talked a little bit about um, uh, NLP, NLP already, but um, we recently submitted a grant uh, to the FDA um, to use uh, or to develop kind of a standardized methodology for real world data use for regulatory decision making. Part of that does include some NLP um, work in uh, validating those, um, that standardization. Um, but, but the hope would be that we could kind of develop that into its own kind of separate um, 
uh, work stream as well for certain person for things. Now we're still waiting on that one uh, and to decide or to see if it gets funded or not. Um, we've also used um, KRN as a complementary piece for some of the other grants that we've submitted um, through some of our larger um, uh, prospective consortia um, and ongoing as well. Kevin, we're ready for you. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the natural language processing. Uh, can you just say a little bit more about whether your current plans include sort of a broader artificial intelligence sort of approach to this? Because it seems like you're really sort of to tread, you're starting to tread in those waters, you mean? And I, yeah. I, think some real I, actually had a meet, I actually had a meeting about this yesterday. Um, but yes, I think that's where this is headed. And I think that, um, you know, NLP is one kind of uh, use of potential use of that. The other really is that these diseases are so rare and so diverse that a lot of the learning that we're going to be able to do is not going to be through these trial mechanisms and things like that. It's going to be understanding what the pathways of care are. And each pathway of care is so unique that, you know, our traditional ways of modeling that I think are not going to be sufficient. Um, and so trying to figure out, you know, what, um, what methodology is, um, you know, fits right with being able to take some of the data that we have and potentially, you know, what, what other data would be necessary to understand these very, very kind of unique care pathways and what information um, those, you know, those longitudinal data could can glean for us. I think it's really, you know, where the added value would be. So the answer is yes. <laughs> um, so uh, I've mentioned a little bit uh, about the expansion already, so we're still working on that. That's a, a kind of a longer term uh, work. And the current research work that we're looking into right now is prediabetes and kidney disease um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it's really kind of under-recognized um, with all <laughs> the immunosuppression and steroids that these folks get. And so that paper is hopefully going to be submitted relatively soon. Um, hypertension control um, with more stringent guidelines. Uh, 2017, I think both the PEDS guidelines and the adult guidelines changed. Um, and so it gives us a little bit of a, um, a ability to um, look into uh, um, how hypertension control has changed with those guidelines. And that's actually will be presented on Thursday um, at the Pediatric Research Symposium. And then um, along with kind of the data expansion, one of our kind of case uses that we're gonna be looking at is, is what the nephrotoxic medication exposures are both for patients who have kidney disease and the patients who um, you know, have other diseases uh, in the general population. So that's it. Uh, it's an old picture, but this is the team. Um, big thanks to um, mentors and advisors. Deb obviously is not here anymore, um, but uh, special shout out to Kevin who um, has uh, had the pleasure or maybe not the pleasure of hearing about um, all my uh, trials and tribulations over the last year on a monthly basis. Um, and to Lisa and Jeremy for um, you know, their additional support and, and help along the, the path. And I'm happy to take any additional questions. And feel free to put it in the chat also and we can read it if you're online. There's quite a few people there. What a good looking crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the troubles with quantifying steroid use. Yeah. Which I find <laughs> problematic no matter what data source you're looking at. Um, the way um, our group has done it, which is flawed for sure, but it's the clinician reports it at each outpatient per year. On steroids, not on steroids. Oh, so at least you have one yeah. data point. But how long were the on steroids? What is it started in started and stopped in between visits? It, you don't have that information yeah. using that. And if you could link up with pharmacy data, that would be ideal. But even in pharmacy data, you don't know how long they actually took it for. Well, I, I think one of the things that I was, it, it's just the, the practice variability is, is such that it makes it tough. But, you know, here at Michigan, our, it, the steroid kind of use and weaning is, is nurse-driven. And so there's usually a telephone encounter 
Um, so at some point with the natural language processing, I could probably get to that here at Michigan. Um, I obviously that just really depends on how folks do that type of work on in every other kind of venue. Um, and so I think that's that's some of the trouble. Just give you a prescription, say so use it when you're sick. In yeah, between, you I think I think that's been open. really it's been really tough to get a sense of that. Um, unless you can, you know, and, and these buckets are actually kind of the lower hanging fruit of that, right? Or the lower hanging kind of possibility of that is okay. They were on steroids. They're not on steroids anymore, and they're on something else. You can consider them either steroid dependent or steroid resistant, or something along those lines. Um, maybe with some of your protein, you're doing something like that, but. Um, Figuring out what criteria you're going to use and then, you know, testing that, I think, is the top part. Yeah, it seems Kevin important. Kevin has his hand up again. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. I have to unmute. Um, so um, could you just say a little bit about some things that you and I have talked about in the past months, uh, which I think might have general interest here to uh, at least a, a broader group, which would be the idea of using other technologies or other methods to extract information from electronic health records uh, as being we've talked about like fire based that is like FHIR the uh, the standard for pulling things out of electronic uh, health records or or a standard that would facilitate that uh, do you have plans to delve into that a bit at this point because that could be applicable to work that others are doing uh, yeah well. I mean I, I it's not it's not currently part of you know, what I'm working on doing, but I do think that it's, it's really important to, to add those in. I think the, the question really becomes is in what capacity and for what specific kind of um, data elements, like, you know, for instance, the, the admission discharge type of information, I think could be crucial, um, with, especially when you have a patient population, like, you know, needs nephrology patients who, maybe see their peds nephrologists here at Michigan, but don't see them any, don't, don't see kind of any other specialist or, or primary care within the Michigan system. Um, so you would have their EHR data here, but you would potentially have uh, the ability to, to either go get or have delivered data on their, you know, admissions, discharge or something along those lines. Um, the idea with the mobile health application, which I don't think I fully um, uh, described is that that application would allow you to link your EHR data via your patient portal. Um, and you could link as many data, as many EHRs as you want. Um, and so patients could potentially link their, um, their nephrologist's EHR, um, and then also their primary care's EHR or something along those lines. So that's one way we'd have, you know, some of that applicability. And I know that the, the care evolution is using a lot of these technologies to, to, to do a lot of those data polls in themselves. So I guess, you know, tangentially we are, we are, we are using that, some of that technology. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to chat more um, offline if anybody has any questions. Thanks so much.